Good morning, good morning, St. Paul and E. It is such a blessing to be with you this morning. If you are in up and down the East Coast, I hope you are dry and well. Um, I will turn it over for our doxology now. to worship from Brother Jeff Fair and Deborah Fair. Sister Deborah Fair. Call to worship. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a door, doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wickedness. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. O Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your honor dwells. For the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth sing praises. Amen, amen. Good morning, St. Paul. The scripture says God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him.
distracted about because the the song is just so good praise god he is such a good god he is such a good god Amen. next we will move into our invocation with reverend robert thompson loving god let us pray loving god we're so grateful to you for the gift of life that is ours on this day the beauty that we see around us, God, for all the things you've given us that have brought us to this moment. We praise you, we laud and magnify your name. God, we confess that it is not by our own worth or our own value, or our own efforts that we find any blessing in this day, but it is because of your blessings to us, your love for us, your, your patience with us, your, your longing for us that we are brought here today. Uh, we confess that truth were to be told and let us tell the truth. We confess, God, that we don't often live up to the expectations that we even hold of ourselves as Christians. We don't always love our neighbor as ourselves. We, we don't even consider it sometimes. We don't always forgive ourselves or others. We don't even think about it. But instead, God, sometimes we enshroud ourselves in, in self-righteousness and our anger as if we have a right to allow divisions between us to grow up and develop. And as if this were not our responsibility to try to sow seeds of love and reconciliation and peace wherever we walk instead. We confess to you, O oh God, that there are times when we lose hope, when we are consumed with the ugliness of this world and forget that ours is the way of peace and possible. 
sometimes, God, we are just overwhelmed and tired. Whatever our circumstances, whatever, whatever reality we find ourselves in or portion of reality we find ourselves battling on this day, we bring it all to you, God, and lay our entire lives before you. Thanking you for the privilege of doing this. Thank you, God, that you are the type of God we can bring our whole selves to, and you will see us, you will care for us, you will indeed love us in spite of ourselves. God, what a marvelous, amazing God you are, that such is the case. You love us in spite of ourselves, that, that you celebrate us when we see only sadness, that you do not give up on us. We are so thankful, God. We are so thankful. And God, as we look at this world, as we look at this girl, we, 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 God, we, we do pray, God, that, that your spirit would hear us and know our needs. We pray for those people in Afghanistan who have been, in the end, victimized by America's 20-year presence there. God, we share something in this. Our government that was there, our government that did this, half of us, our troops left in spite of the best that we might have thought possible, these Afghanis were left, are now left in the hands of their enemy. God, such a terrible, terrible reality, God. But God, it's only one of the things we need to struggle with on this day, God. We, 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 everywhere we look, we can see a, a need to do something, to love more here, to love better there, to forgive more completely here, to love, to love more where we are, where we walk. God, we pray that your spirit would, would lighten our pathways. We can see where to go. We pray that your power would, would touch our hands that we can serve with your purposes in mind. We pray that, that, that your energy would so comport our lives and our hearts, would so speak to our needs that we will be both healed and empowered and that others seeing and knowing us will feel and know the blessings of loving God and and the, and the benefits of trying to serve Christ. God, we're just trying to do the best we can here. We pray for your spirit to help us, God. Show us how to love our neighbor as ourselves. Teach us to forgive one another. Show us how not to give up. Let us not take advantage. And let us not lose the advantage that we're given because our mothers and our fathers and our forefathers, and our, they all prayed for us. We are descended from people who prayed for us. Help us, God, to live as if we were going to honor their sacrifice, their commitment, their faithfulness. God, let us take advantage of this, of this life that we have and, and live it in love dedicated to thee. Show us how to love you more completely. Show us, God, and so touch us, God, that we can look at our lives and see what it is we need to do in order to accomplish your will. God, we pray that you will bless this congregation. You will bless and touch its leadership, its officers, that all of us who are here, God, on these Sundays would, would feel your presence, would know your presence, and would benefit greatly from walking more closely with you just how to pray for each other. Remind us that we should pray for each other. God, as we move through each day struggling and trying to see love and to spread love, let us, God, do so knowing that you have already paid the ultimate price for us. All we need to do is say yes to you. Yes to your presence in our lives. Yes, to your sovereignty over our lives. Yes, to your care. Yes, to your expectations. Yes, to your undying possibilities that we look at this world that through our eyes alone seem so often without hope. But God, with your presence, with your eyes, with your vision, with your light, you know there is still hope to be had and still growth to be realized and still peace to be established and still bonds to be secured between us. Help us to grow to become true followers of Christ, worthy of calling ourselves Christian. Let it be, God. So be it in our lives of this day and every day, God. Raise us 
to be your children. In your name we pray. Amen.
Amen, amen, amen. We just want you, Lord. We just want you. Now it is time for us to move into our scripture. And we will be having um, Brother Phil Hillman reading it with us today. Our scripture is taken from James 4, 1 through 10. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enemy against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. God's word for God's people. Amen, amen. And as we reflect on that scripture, and, experience, um, and have uh, praise and worship from our praise team, I would just love to urge everyone to not just be present, but to participate in this worship. That God loves us and that there is an opportunity for all of us, even though we're not in the same room, to lift our voices. There are over a hundred of us on this call. And I know I feel nervous sometimes to bother my neighbors on the left or the right, but sometimes I need it. So as we reflect on the, as we reflect on the scripture, please let us all lift our voices in praise and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I find space for what I treasure.
the Reverend Dr. Ellis I. Washington for this opportunity to stand behind the sacred desk and bring you a word on this morning from my heart and from what God has laid upon it. Let us look to the Lord. Gracious and everlasting God, we thank you. I, your handmaid servant, humble myself before you asking that you decrease me so that you might increase in this place. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Now the passage of scripture that was read earlier comes from the book of James, the fourth chapter, verses one through 10, and I'd like to specifically lift up verses 7 through 10. And it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This morning, I want to talk to you from the subject, my prerogative. I don't know if you all are anything like me or Sister Trinette, where we have gone around seeing people without masks in crowded areas, and it becomes clear to us, separate and apart from any political motivations that it's their prerogative to do that and their prerogative is informed by maybe their own selfish desires. When we think about the people who choosing not to get vaccinated despite the information that suggests that it is important and that it will help prevent the spread of this virus, we can understand and appreciate hesitancy and concern but those people are following their own prerogative to do what they want to do. And sometimes it's at the expense of others. Sometimes it's not. And when I think of those individuals or other people who want to do what they want to do, I can't help because I'm a child of the 70s who came of age in the 90s. I can't help but to think of the Bobby Brown song, My Prerogative. 
doing what he wants to do, what he feels he has the right to do, the privilege to do. He was basically singing about people talking about him and him being tired of all of the backlash that he was catching for gallivanting around with more than one woman. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. He felt that that was the way that he could really live the life that he wanted to live. The lyrics are fairly simple. He says, everybody's talking all this stuff about me. Why don't they just let me live? I don't need permission to make my own decision. That's my prerogative. That was the chorus of this song. And people know it. You sing it. I think we're all old enough to remember that song, or at least most of us are. And sometimes we feel like if we could just do what we wanted to do, our lives would be great conflict free. We'd have all of the things that we want and we'd be with the people that we want to be with. The problem is that when we're thinking like this, our thinking is based on worldly desires and the desires of our flesh. We desire what the world tells us we must have. We desire the demands of our physical nature, those things that likely in some instances don't please God. See, we don't know how to treat one another, or sometimes we act like we don't know how to treat one another, and that leads to, to conflict between people. It's not surprising that in the world that we live in, it's difficult for some folks to treat one another right, when so much of what we see is people treating other people wrong. There are conflicts raging throughout the world, violent extremism out in the world, but also here in these United States. Hatred, political disenfranchisement, corporate theft, government corruption, neighborhood violence, intimate partner violence, actions that are driven by people's desires to have that which does not belong to them in one way or another. Leaving in their path victims of their desires to take. Whether through the taking of life, or the taking of opportunity, or the taking of resources, what they are ultimately taking is someone's peace. As a result, there's quarreling and fighting, backstabbing, tension in our own lives and in the lives of others and those who we love. We get into arguments because there is a disagreement over something that we want or something that the other wants, whether we what we want is something tangible or material, or whether it's something ideological or conceptual. Sometimes we will do whatever it takes to get what we want, even if it means hurting someone else, disappointing someone else, offending someone else. It is our desires that are not rooted in what God has for us that lead to conflict between us and others. Then we have this problem because we don't know how to approach God. Not all of us, but some of us, or even those of us who know how to approach God somehow forget. We're asking God to bless us with a, a house or a, a car or a financial blessing so that we can satisfy those carnal desires. And not to say that those are things that we should not be asking for, that we should not be seeking God's intervention on. But at the same time, what is the reason that we are asking for those things? Is it for status? Is it for wealth? Is it for position that we are asking these things of God? We want a promotion or a new position, but, but why? So that people will look up to us in a certain way, or is it because we want to do something that is within the will and providence of God? We keep asking for a breakthrough, but what is it that we are asking God to break us through? Sometimes God has us in a place or a situation for a reason, but we are so self-centered and focused on our desires that we miss the blessing that God is trying to give us. So we're so focused on what we believe is important and what we believe is valuable because of what the world says to us as opposed to what the word says to us. See, God won't provide 
the wrong things to us if it is not within God's will. And then we end up wondering why we have not received the blessings that we thought we were entitled to. Well, for starters, we can't go talking to God all crazy, asking God to hook us up like we were back in high school talking to one of our friends who used to work at the store or at the fast food restaurant like, yo, man, can you hook me up? But more importantly, you know, and I, maybe I'm not talking about anybody on this Zoom. Maybe that's just my own experience. But more importantly, we're not asking God to give us what is a part of God's divine will and plan for our lives. When we find ourselves in these situations where we're wondering why haven't we received what we've been praying for, what we've been asking for, we have to ask ourselves that question is what we are praying for and asking for within the will of God. God has unlimited resources, but don't think that God is willing to waste them on the frivolous desires that will draw us away from God. Finally, we don't appreciate the things and the people that are already in our lives sometimes. We are surrounded by God's blessings all the time, but we're often looking over them because we're too busy focusing on what we don't have. We're so busy worrying about the people that we want to be in our lives that we overlook and take for granted the people who are already in our lives. People that love us and care for us, but we're so focused on trying to make new relationships, to establish ourselves, to gain position. All the while, we may be neglecting the very relationships that got us where we are in the first place. If we're not careful, We'll fool around and lose those people and be alone, or we will have alienated the people who we're supposed to have in our lives. You know that saying about it takes a village? Well, we have to remember that you have to be willing to be a part of the village as well. That's what happens when you choose to live your life according to your own prerogative. The things that you think will make your life worth living can sometimes be the things that take you away from God's will for your life and bring you drama, strife, and isolation. But when your prerogative is submitting to God, you can truly live your life the way it is supposed to be lived. And we can see this in the text. We receive an admonition to this effect in the book of James. This book is attributed to James, the brother of Jesus and the leader of the Jerusalem church. This book reflects on his effort to strengthen and build a Christian community based on the values found in Christ's lessons. We're given some insight about what happens when we're not submitted to God. He's writing to a church that appears to be in some sort of conflict. There's no definitive determination of a particular group of believers that the author is writing to, but it is certainly clear that things are not running smoothly. It might even be safe to say that this group of folks was a mess. The book begins with discussing the disparity between the rich and the poor and how the rich need to be mindful that their status does not mean very much in God's eyes. The author then goes on to instruct the recipients of this epistle that they must not only be hearers of God's word, but also doers of the word. It appears that there was a good number of folks who were a part of the religious community just as a matter of status or belonging, but not out of an earnest desire to be in relationship with God. Then he tells them not to show favoritism to the wealthy, that their faith must bear some fruit because faith without works is dead. And just before talking about submitting to God, he tells them that they need to control their tongues, pointing out the contradiction that out of the same mouth that blesses the Lord, on one hand, come curses against the people that were created in the very image of God, on the other hand. In chapter 4, the author poses a rhetorical question about where they think all the quarreling comes from. He then goes on to describe how it comes from the war that's going on within themselves. 
because of their cravings and their desires for the things of this world. They were focused on the wrong things, worldly things, fleshly desires. And he tells them that they don't even have what God has in store for them because they won't ask God for what it is that they need. But even if they did, they would mess it up somehow because they would likely ask for things that are outside of the will of God. They would want things that they have no business having, but they feel it's what they're supposed to have. It could be material things, or it could be status or position. It could be people that they want in their lives. But no matter what it is, they won't receive it because God will not waste it by allowing them to squander it on their own lustful desires and pleasures. Then get this. He, he, he tells them that they're cheating on God. He drops a bomb on them and calls them adulterers. Basically, he tells them that they are cheating on God. That the God, that, that, what, that what God wants what is best for us and placed his spirit to dwell in his believers. And God longs for that relationship and connection because there's, no, there's so much more to give, more than they could even imagine, more than they even deserve to have. But God is willing to give it to them. The author tries to make it plain for them by telling them that if they don't get it together, God will oppose them. But if they are humble, God will give them more than they deserve, but they will have to submit themselves to God. And so now you may be saying to yourself, well, that sounds all well and good, but the relevant question is, how will I be able to live my life if I submit to God? Actually, isn't it supposed to be the other way around? That's why so many people, I assume, don't join the church. Because they want to continue living the life that they think is the life they're supposed to be living, which they know is inconsistent with God's will. They realize that when they join the church, or they suspect that when they join the church, they'll have to let go of those things, that way of life, and that behavior that is inconsistent with God's will. They, they still want to live according to their prerogative. But what they fail to realize in some instances is that if they make submitting to God their prerogative, they'd live the life that they're supposed to be living. What some of us fail to realize is that when we make submitting to God our prerogative, we will live the life we're supposed to live. So when you submit to God, right, because the question is, how will I be able to live my life if I submit to God? Well, here's how the passage of Scripture informs us to do that. We have to resist and draw near. When, when we submit to God, we realize that we have the power to resist the devil. We're told that we can resist the devil and tell the devil no. It's when we let the enemy get a foothold in our minds that we begin to lose the battle. Because once there's a foothold in their minds, there's then a foothold in our hearts which informs our actions and our behaviors. But if we resist the devil, the devil will flee from us. If, if it doesn't say, if the, the, the scripture doesn't say that the enemy will come harder the next time around, it says that he will flee from us. The next verse goes on to say that if we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. It's just like any relationship that's worth having. You usually have to meet the person part of the way. We've got to move close to God. We've got to move closer to God in our individual relationships. We've got to move closer to God as a church. We've got to draw closer to God in our communities. When we draw nearer to God, we live from a place of love and the fruit of the Spirit begin to manifest and we don't have to have all of the division and strife because we are more loving and more kind and more patient and full of faith. Resist the enemy and the enemy will flee from you and draw near to God. The next thing we need to do to live our lives in a way that is consistent with what God is calling us to do is 
to repent, we will be able to live in community. And part of submitting to God is being able to admit that we are wrong. Verse 8 and 9 says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and joy to gloom. Sometimes that's the hardest thing for us to do is to admit that we're wrong, that we messed up, that we didn't get it right. And then to take it a step further, apologize and say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I didn't do the right thing. When we're living foul, it stains us. It stains everything around us and what we put our hands on. We need to wash our hands of the things that are keeping us from living a righteous life. Unforgiveness, favoritism, troublemaking, envy. It doesn't go away by itself. We need to get away from the mess. We also need to feel contrition. If we have truly submitted to God, we should feel that what we have done is wrong. We should cry out, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. I don't know about you, but there have been some times when I've sat and looked at myself in the mirror. And I've recognized my own failings and my own shortcomings and all the ways that I feel that I have let God down and the ways that I have not been the person that God has called me to be and I'm sorry. I say I'm sorry. I feel that I'm sorry. I feel remorseful and it makes me sad and it makes my heart heavy. But fortunately for us as believers, if our prerogative is to submit to God's will, then we know that although weeping may endure for a night, joy comes in the morning. And that joy that comes in the morning is because we are able to restore a right relationship with God. We are able to be reconciled because we have repented and turned away from the things that have kept us out of right relationship with God. We are able to be in community because of our contrition. We are now surrounded by the people we love because they notice how we're different. And we are able to live the life that we are supposed to live if we're surrounded by the people who love us and care for us, surrounded by a community of believers who are all committed to spreading the gospel of Christ and strengthening up one another and making sure that souls are saved and building out our communities and addressing the strife and division and corruption in the world through the example that we live by modeling after Christ and him resurrected. Repent. And finally, we are told to humble ourselves and that God will exalt us. Verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. That is the very essence of submitting to God. It is humbling ourselves that allows us to receive what God has in store for us. It is recognizing that the glory and the majesty and the power is of God and that anything that we receive is a blessing. It's not because we're so special. It's not because we're so fantastic or, or wealthy or smart or, or well-connected, but rather it is because God saw fit for us to be that way, to be in relationship. Because God loved us so much that he gave us his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If we humble ourselves like Christ humbled himself. Christ humbled himself when he took on flesh. He, he, he humbled himself when he hung out with the poor and when he hung out with these fishermen of, of no reputation. He, he humbled himself when he was chilling with prostitutes and tax collectors and people of ill repute. He humbled himself when he washed the feet of his disciples, setting a model and example for Christ's leadership and servant leadership. It was his prerogative to submit to God. So he humbled himself when he was betrayed and unjustly tried and sentenced to death. They stretched him high and and hung him high and they stretched him wide. But he, but he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men, all humanity unto me. Christ humbled himself and was exalted. And he did it for me 
so that I could receive God's grace. And he did it for you so that you can receive God's grace. And he did it for the whole world so that we could all receive God's grace so that it is my prerogative to submit myself to God so there will be less strife and less conflict in my life and in my community and in my workplace. It's my prerogative to submit myself to God and repent so that I can live in community with others. It's my prerogative to submit myself to God, be humble so that I may be exalted, not for my sake, but for the sake of the church, not for my sake, but for the sake of the gospel, not for my sake, but for the sake of those who would receive Christ. Some people might say I'm crazy, but I really don't care. It's my prerogative. It's my prerogative to resist the enemy. It's my prerogative to repent. It's my prerogative to humble myself before the Lord. It's my prerogative. It's my prerogative. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Glory to God. And it is, it is your prerogative to resist the enemy, to repent of your sins, and to humble yourself before the Lord. The St. Paul AME Church family is here to welcome and to support you. And so if you are interested in engaging in this journey of submission to God so that you can avoid the conflict and strife will rise above it because you are living the life that God has called you to live. If you are interested in joining in community with a body of believers who are interested and committed to teaching people of, about Jesus Christ and helping them to, to follow him, then we would, ex we would love to welcome you into the membership uh, of St. Paul. All you have to do is text the word JOIN to the number 617 860 3777, and you'll see that number later uh, in the service as well. But we would love to have you. Our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Ellis I. Washington, would love uh, to be your pastor. And this membership is not constrained by geography or location. Thanks to the advent of technolo technology like Zoom, we could welcome you all as members. Amen. Amen. What a spectacular, spectacular sermon. Thank you so much, Reverend Rashawn Hall. It was wonderful. Um, so I think what we might do is have everyone put their prayer requests in the chat. And we can make sure that we, we address those and we'll make sure that we save those. And with that, we can actually move on to our, our offering um, that will be led through by Sister Deborah Fair. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. So right now we are going to move to our tithes and our offering. If you will with me in unison, say our offering prayer. I give today as a part of my worship. My giving is an act of faith. I trust you, Lord. And I believe your word. My giving reflects my gratitude for all you have blessed me with. And in my giving, I plant a seed in the rich soil of the kingdom. Help me, Lord, as I learn to walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen. There are numerous ways that you're able to give um, your offering, your tithe and your offerings to St. Paul. You can contribute from your smartphone. You just want to text SP Cambridge to 73256, that number again is 73256. Or you can use Cash App, uh, dollar sign SP Cambridge. Once again, that's Cash App, dollar sign SP Cambridge. Or we can still take it by mail. You can mail to St. Paul Amy Church, 85 Bishop Allen Drive. That's Cambridge, Mass, 02139. Let's look to the Lord, dear Heavenly Father. We're just so grateful for these tithes and these offerings that we are about to give, Father God, to do such great works in your kingdom, not only to help feed the hungry and clothe the naked God and, and shelter those that are homeless, but just to help those in need. And also just to tend to our church that we call home, our church home, 
there are needs there as well. So we are grateful for this. We're thankful for this opportunity to serve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Sister Deb, before we finish the, uh, with the offering, hey, uh, greetings, everyone. Let me just lift up a request from our presiding bishop, Bishop Julius H. McAllister, Sr., that each church in the district lift up some offering for, for Haiti relief, and we'll send it to the 16th Episcopal District. And so if you're doing it electronically, you might have to do two separate transactions, one for your regular tithes and offerings, and then do another and put in the comment, or memo section, Haiti. And of course, if you're sending a check, you can just certainly earmark that portion of your check or whatever um, uh, that you're giving that way. But please lift up something for our brothers and sisters in Haiti. There's much suffering going on in Haiti, and we have the opportunity, particularly as a connectional church, uh, to do something uh, tangible along with the other churches of the first district and, of course, the connection. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So we'll see if, if Brother Bobby is on the line. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Good morning. Oh, my goodness. What a wonderful sermon. Thank you so much, Brother. It's 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. And Jesus is all the world to me. Yes, my life, is. my joy, my all. And I am sad. To him I go. No other one can cheer me so.
Amen. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. So now we will move into our announcements. So corporate prayer, <laughs> Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. and 9.30 p.m. Uh, the number is 515-604-9099. The access code to that corporate prayer is 389-733-3722. We want to welcome all our guests. Text the word guests to 617-860-3777. We'd like to hear from all of our guests. And to join our St. Paul family, text the word join to 617-860-3777. Our mission, we introduce all people to Jesus and help them follow him. Our vision, St. Paul AME Church seeks to develop God-focused followers of Christ who are committed to kingdom building by implementing the Great Commission, making disciples and guiding them toward maturity. Watch us on YouTube, search for St. Paul AME Church, Cambridge. You can also find us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter and you can follow us on Instagram. Uh, youth Church School Recruitment Drive, looking for youth ages four to 17 years of age. Uh, they engage in a Bible-based church program. St. Paul's Youth Church School offers a Bible-based curriculum, interactive learning and discussions, virtual Zoom sessions, so youth do not need to reside in our state or country fun games and activities. If you know of a youth that can benefit from this experience, please get in touch with Brother Marshall Stanton at 617-840-2166. Classes resume in September. The Boston Mayoral Forum, we really need your participation in GBIO's Mayoral Forum on August 31st from 7 to 9 p.m. All five candidates will be in attendance, and we need a huge turnout to demonstrate the collective power of GBIO's members. Check your email to register. There's a link there. Our next worship service will be Sunday, August 29th at 10 a.m. And now for our benediction. Amen, St. Paul. I just want to, uh, before the benediction, lift up uh, some of the prayer requests and uh, close it out uh, with the benediction. And after that, we'll go into our breakout uh, groups. Uh, we'll just see that uh, request for prayers for Zofia, Bunny Harris, um, and uh, Sister Cynthia's brother, Richard, and family. Um, they were, she was hospitalized yesterday for a blood clot. Uh, Pastor Jordan is home, so prayers for continued healing, prayers for Brother Reggie Riley, uh, prayer for uh, Sister Diane's cousin Wendy and her husband Hal for the loss of their oldest son. Uh, pray for uh, Sister Cora Rollins' niece Margaret, who's hospitalized in Barbados with COVID. Prayers for Haiti and Afghanistan and the neighboring countries. Uh, prayer for Coletta, COVID-19, has COVID-19 and is in ICU, and Al Taylor, who has a tumor on his hip. Uh, praying for believers in Afghanistan that God will send his angels to encamp around them. Um, prayer for sister-in-law, uh, Phyllis Rollins, who's in Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, sister Cabobo is praying for family back home as they're journeying through another family member with COVID. Uh, prayer request for Paula Evans in North Carolina, uh, who heads the youth uh, dance ministry starting in chemo in uh, September. Uh, so we'll lift up uh, these prayers uh, and others. Let us go to the Lord. Holy and everlasting God, we thank you for your divine providence and your divine will, Lord. You have seen and heard and know all of the prayers that have been lifted up, the requests that have been made, whether it is for prayers of healing, for 
or illness, cancer related or COVID uh, or any other maladies that afflict the body, Lord, we know that you are a healer. And so we plead the blood of Jesus Christ on all those who are suffering and in stages of recovery, asking for your healing on their lives, dear Lord, and for their loved ones and family members, that they might be encouraged and comforted in their support and caring uh, for those who are sick. Lord, we continue to pray for the people in Afghanistan who are dealing with the aftermath of a 20-year war and our involvement uh, that precipitated the the confusion and the chaos that exists there, Lord, that the hearts and minds of those in leadership would be shifted to make some sort of amends to receive those who might be refugees, dear Lord, and provide resources for getting people out of there and finding a way to stabilize that nation and the surrounding countries. And those who are in Haiti, Lord, who are suffering the devastation of yet another earthquake, dear Lord, that there could be capacity to provide for the needs of those who are harmed or without food or shelter and who have been traumatized, Lord. We ask for your peace to prevail in all these things, Lord, in all of the cares and concerns of our hearts, we lift them up to you, trusting and knowing, Lord, that is those things that are within your will that you will address them. Now, Lord, we ask that you continue to guide our hearts, that we might resist the devils, that he might flee from us and draw near to you, dear Lord. We ask that you convict our hearts, that we might repent and turn away from the things that have kept us out of right relationship with you, dear Lord. And finally, we ask that we are humbled within ourselves, dear Lord, so that we would be exalted, not for ourselves, but that you would be lifted up and that all humanity would be drawn unto you. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with these your people, hence now and forevermore, and let the redeemed of the church, Lord, say, Amen. Oh.